is brought to you by Yamaha, revs your heart. Polaris, think outside. Ford F-Series, Canada's best-selling line of pickup trucks for 55 years. Tough, smart, capable. I've been a snowmobiler for as long as I can remember, and even when I was a kid snowmobiling, I seem to recall that triples always had something about them. I mean, triples had the sound, they had the power, they had the speed that we all remember, and when you think back of that era, I mean, the sound of triples just always comes to mind screaming across a lake. Now, I do love twins, but triples will always have a special place in my heart. And because of that, I've got an old 650 Indy that I've had forever, and it's the sled that really got me into snowmobiling when I was younger for traveling and everything else, and really was the reason I got into snowmobile television shows. But recently, though, I've decided to add to my three-cylinder collection. I brought home a blue SRX, and then last year, a Mach Z came to the shop. Now the Mach Z was actually two Mach Zs, one decent sled and another parts machine, which is super handy to have when you're going to be running old iron like this Mach Z. Now the Mach that was the good one was in decent shape, but it wasn't running because of a stator issue. Although it didn't take me long to get it running after I robbed a stator off of, well, the parts machine. And it also didn't take me too long to figure out a new nickname for the Mach Z. In short order, it became the SCSI. Now, Little did I know at that time that the SCSI would become such a big part of the STV season last year. Like every year with STV, we're always on the hunt for stories. Now a lot of these stories come from what we call destination features. Now a destination feature is where we take up the whole crew, go to some snowmobiling destination like a travel show would, and then do stories about what it's like to experience snowmobiling in that particular area. Normally, that's what we do. Last year wasn't normal with a global pandemic and these destinations, well, they were a little hard to get to last year. Deadlines though, well, those things kept coming and that left me in a position of coming up with content for STV, content that would normally be those travel stories. The solution though was right in front of me with the SCSI. What's coming up next is a compilation of all the SCSI stories from last year in one epic adventure we're calling the SCSI Saga. So recently I managed to add to my 12 cylinder collection. Up on the shelf there, I've got my 1990 Indy 650, which I've had forever. Then last season, I acquired this Yamaha SRX. And for this year, a 1999 Mach Z has followed me back to the shop and I've nicknamed it the SCSI. <laughs> so at this point, I'm three quarters of the way to my classic triple set. I think a one liter T-Cat might round out this collection nicely, but that'll be for later. Right now, let me tell you about the SCSI. This sled kind of fell in my lap. I was telling a buddy I was looking for something like this, and he hooked me up with another friend who had this machine. Now, it wasn't advertised for sale. The mock was just kind of hanging out in the guy's shop collecting dust. So we made the deal, and here it is. As you can see, this thing was last on the trail in the winter of 2018, which wasn't that long ago. Now, it was parked because the engine started to have some problems. It got really hard to turn over, and when you did turn it over by hand, you could feel like a metal-on-metal, metal, grindy, scrapey feel going on in there. It was really ugly. So this thing was not a runner when I bought it. The deal also came with an entire second Mach-Z in 1998, but as you can see, some assembly may be required. Now it's actually a little too far gone and picked over to come back to life, but there's still a lot of good parts here. Lucky too, because that scraping sound that was coming out of this motor turned out to be the stator, but luckily enough, there was one in the spare engine from that other sled. So changed it out, swapped some wires around, put a new Deutsch connector on, and the SCSI came to life and it ran good. Well, sort of good. With the engine running, we cleaned it up a bit and started on some general maintenance. Nothing special, we just greased it, changed the chain case oil, replaced a couple of bogey bearings, and then ran a good eyeball over everything. The old girl isn't perfect, but she should be a good runner. Basically, it's all there with only a couple of things that uh, need to be addressed right now. Number one, the front bumper is faded and already cracked, and it's missing the hood hold down thingy rubber things back here. So, I had to make an order to Kimpex. 
This stuff is purely aesthetic, but being broken and missing was annoying me, so I had to change them out right away. But I don't think this is the last of the parts from Kimpex to get delivered to the shop, because they've got a bunch of stuff I'll need to breathe reliable, new life into the SCSI. So I did go for a quick burn around the shop on this thing the other day, and it has the dreaded triple cylinder bog when you get on the throttle. Now, it could be in the clutches, but I also bet that rave valves are pretty gummy on this thing. So that's a couple of jobs I'm gonna have to do real soon. Right now though, I'm gonna go scavenge that carcass over there because there's a few things I like. It's got yellow grill covers, and those skis look way better than these ones. So I'm gonna go shopping over here first. I'm so happy because today I get to do exhaust valve maintenance on the SCSI. Yay for me. Thankfully, they're really accessible. <laughs> yeah, not really. Um, so while I dig into this process, I'm going to go to voiceover so I can curse the thousand springs that are holding this exhaust system in. So a little tip for getting these springs out. If you don't have a spring puller, uh, use an old screwdriver. Just kind of carve or grind a little hook into the end. But that little hook is a great way to hook the springs and then pull them on and off. If not, these things are a pain in the balls. Exhaust valves have become really popular in the 90s and have stuck with performance two-strokes ever since. Think of them as a crude way to mechanically introduce variable valve timing in two-cycle engines where there are no valves. This system is basically there to optimize the performance at both low and high RPM, which is always a compromise on two-strokes. With the pipes out of the way on the SCSI, I'm going to use this used engine to kind of show you how they work, which is pretty simple. Basically, the exhaust valves on a Rotax motor are called rave valves, and what they do, like all exhaust valves, is at low RPM, there's a guillotine that's kind of blocking off a bit of the exhaust port. At higher RPM, that guillotine, in this case, gets moved out of the way with the assistance of exhaust gas pressure and opens up that exhaust port, giving you that high-end performance you're looking for. It's pretty simple. Now, Back to voiceover while I get the rave valves out of that sled. Obviously these valves live in a pretty bad environment, which is why they need to be on a cleaning schedule. Deposits from the burnt exhaust gases gum them up, and because there isn't a lot of power moving them in and out, just exhaust pressure and this delicate return spring for the rave valves, they basically get stuck and stop moving. So like I mentioned before, some of these exhaust valve systems are activated by cables, but essentially they all do the same job. They all live in the same environment, they're all going to get dirty, and that means they're all going to have to get cleaned. Now there's the why you have to do this maintenance. For the how, your best bet is to go to YouTube and download the correct procedure for your exact machine. Now I'm still going to walk through the cleaning procedure for these rave valves, but other systems could be a little bit different and you want to make sure you get it right. Whichever type of exhaust valve system you have, you will probably need a gasket and O-ring set, and I strongly suggest picking one up before you begin. You may get lucky and you can reuse the old gaskets, but these kits are pretty cheap and if you don't need them, they don't go bad. Taking the system apart, the best thing to do is keep everything in order if you don't know it by heart. You'll also need some kind of solvent to help break down the deposit, so have that on hand too. And the other thing to remember is you don't want to damage anything, so don't use scrapers or hard files, and no grinders with wire wheels either. Be extra careful cleaning up the aluminum jugs too. Now it's hard to get down inside the bores, and you will be tempted to use a screwdriver to shove a rag in there. I'm not saying don't do that or that I've never done that, just be real careful. You can scratch things up in there pretty easily. Don't go overboard with solvents either. They can wash garbage down into the crankcase. Assembly is pretty straightforward. Now, I do like to do all three valves at the same time. It's a little faster, but you can do them one at a time as well. Either way, this is not a difficult job. And like I mentioned earlier, there's tons of videos online that will go into all kinds of detail for your specific application. So even a novice mechanic can get this job done.
So there's always gonna be a couple of details to pay attention to, like what side is the top side for the guillotine, and if there's any ports in the gaskets that you need to pay attention to. If you get this stuff wrong, you could cause damage or the exhaust valves aren't gonna work at all. Timing wise for a job like this, it's gonna probably take you a couple hours, nothing more. But if there was a problem with the exhaust valves and you get them working again, huh, you're definitely gonna notice a difference in the performance of your machine. Honestly, up to this point, I've been getting pretty down on the snowmobile season. MF COVID-19 has been absolutely destroying my schedule and getting on my last nerve. So much so that until recently, I was actually thinking of selling a couple of these old triple sleds to buy car parts to fix my broken race car back there. Well, that was until last weekend anyways, when I got all three of these beauties running and went for a burn in the backyard behind the barn. It's amazing how two-stroke smoke can really get the creative juices going. And I think it was on the SCSI here, going about, I don't know, 90, 95 miles an hour down the back lane when I started wondering just how fast this old girl would go. And it came to me in an instant. I need to do a radar run. Out in the lake, I've already prepared a good portion of the track by plowing at a strip about 40 feet wide by 1,320 feet. But before we pack up these beauties, I want to tell you about each of them. So this is my collection of the four classic triple sleds that I'm going to take out to the lake. And to tell you more about them, I'm going to start with the SCSI, the newest sled in the fleet. If you've been watching STV this season, you've already seen this sled a couple times here in the shop. To recap, it's a 1999 Mach-Z, which was the performance peak for Skidoo back then. Stock, this sled made between 150 and 160 horsepower at the crank from its three cylinders and triple pipes. Out front, it's got the ADSA trailing arm front suspension with a mogul crushing six and a quarter inches of travel. Uh, sorry, I said that wrong. It really should say six and a quarter inches of travel absolutely crushed by moguls. Out back is a coupled SC10 rear skid that has, well, you guessed it, 10 inches of travel. What's interesting is you can still see elements of the suspension in modern skidoos, which should tell you how good this piece really was. Now, all this goodness is mounted to a CK3 chassis weighing in at 572 pounds. This machine also puts the rider in a perfect feet forward riding position, allowing you to hang serious amounts of ham off the side of the seat in an attempt to keep the inside ski down in the corners. Back in the day when this sled was new, I was on an old Polaris Storm, which I thought was pretty good. That was until I saw the Mach-Z. Actually, I got a better look at the Mach-Z's taillights because every time I ran one, it would absolutely walk on that old Storm. So when I started my quest for classic triple sleds from each one of the manufacturers, the Mach-Z was the only skidoo I was looking for. Up next is the prettiest sled I have, a 2001 Yamaha SRX. This is a potent 700 triple triple that pumps out somewhere just north of 140 ponies, which is pretty good for a sled weighing in at 520 pounds. Out front is a low slung trailing arm suspension with gold compression adjustable Olin shocks, damping a debatable seven inches of travel. Out back inside the track is a pro action rear skid that at one time would travel eight inches up and down. One modification here is adjustable transfer rods that are set up for weight transfer. This sled will snap the skis off the ground at the slightest tickle of the fun flipper. And this thing sounds good hiking those skis too. The triple pipes that require the hood to bulge out around them make this machine an absolute symphony on the snow. Despite it having a stock exhaust system, 18,000 kilometers on the clock and piston rings that are in desperate need of replacement, this is still one of the best sounding triples on the snow. And it's blue too, the proper color for an SRX. The next sled in the lineup is my old 1990 Polaris Indy 650. Back in the day, this machine was the baddest on the block, pumping out just shy of 100 horsepower from the Fuji engine that didn't have any power valves and originally exhausted through a single expansion pipe and muffler. Despite this three into one system, the old Indy 650 created that iconic triple cylinder whale that is still the stuff of legend. Suspension wise, the 650 sports just over six inches of front travel and out back, not quite eight. 
Now these numbers might sound silly today, but were downright cushy in the early 90s. Plus, this machine is an SKS, which pretty much made it a mountain sled back then too. Now I'm a bit of a broken record on this, but for me, the Indy 650 is the machine that really solidified my soul as a sledder. And I don't mean a machine like this one, I mean this actual machine did that. I remember being like 15 years old, getting off a 10 year old Skidoo Citation to squeeze the trigger on this machine in a field out behind the shop here. And that experience absolutely blew my mind. Very few times in my life has a vehicle with an engine in it done that, I can count like five times, and this was one of them. Plus, this is still a good looking piece. With the wedge-shaped hood and sharp corners and grill openings, it looks very muscle car -y. Heck, it even has fake louvers, how great is that? And even the graphics are cool too, thank God there's no purple and pink on this sled, which was popular back then. Even now, when you look at the current line of Polaris sleds, you can see the influence of these old indies. Now you might have noticed that I've modified this one a bit back when it was my daily. I've upgraded to a set of Decker triple pipes and bored the carbs, the jugs, and up the compression ratio in an effort to add maybe another seven or eight horsepower. Then I fitted a bigger seat and fuel tank for more range just so I could get to the fuel station. I also upgraded the track by doubling the lug height to one inch and replaced the original oil shocks with these sick billet aluminum ride effects units on the skis and Kimpex Golds out back. Now, if I had to, I would sell the Moxie or the SRX, but I'm keeping the 650 until this thing turns to dust. Now, for the fourth sled in my collection of a buzzin' dozen, and it's gonna be right here one day, and I know exactly what it's gonna be. A 2001 Articat Thundercat 1000. I want one of these sleds basically for two reasons. Number one, it'll be the perfect sled to round out my collection of triple cylinder sleds from each manufacturer, but also because of a memory that I have. Back in the day, when I was on another snowmobile show, we took delivery of a brand new 2001 Articat Thundercat. Now we rolled that thing out of the trailer brand new and hit the runway, and that sled pulled the speedometer needle all the way back around to zero. It was amazing. Now, I know it's not the proper way to break in a brand new sled, but we didn't care. We even took that sled later in the season to Jaws Performance, threw a set of his pipes on it, and it made 190 horsepower on the crank. That sled was insane to ride. So obviously, I want another one. And one day, it'll go right there. So with the radar run and potential drag race coming up on the lake, I'm gonna choose my missile now because not only are these sleds going to the lake, Rich is also coming to town with a sweet XCR to represent Polaris because even though I love that 650, that is gonna be like bringing a dull butter knife to this fight. Plus, there's a guy I found on the Book of Faces that's gonna come out with a 98 T-Cat. So I think overall, the sled to beat is gonna be the Mach Z. But before I load it up, I'm gonna tinker with it a little bit. It's not cheating, no, 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 no. This is optimizing, yeah. Yeah, optimizing, that's what I'm gonna do. I remember back in the day when top speeds were a huge thing, the Zs would pull like 130 miles an hour stock with just a few tricks like sucking the suspensions right down. Even closing off the air intakes would help at the top end, so I'm gonna do what I can to free up some potential. Although I think this Mach has left ludicrous speed behind it long ago, I figure anything I can do to optimize the sled and therefore optimize my chance of a win is all in the spirit of good competition. There we go, I think that works. A Little sketchy though, but honestly, I'm more worried about that track staying together at speed that's got 11,000 kilometers on it than I am the zip ties I got holding the front suspension down. What could possibly go wrong? Hmm, possibly go wrong. <laughs> Nothing's ever gone wrong before. Anyways, all we have left to do tonight is load these bad boys up into the box so we can take them to the lake and race tomorrow.
All right, so it's the next day today and we're all at the lake. Rich is here, Don's here, my Facebook buddy that's come out with his T-Cat. So we've got one sled from each manufacturer represented and I'm, I'm telling you, we're here to race. It's gonna be a good day. And this morning I was doing some track maintenance out there and I may have carved in an ice oval track. That may come into play later. Anyways, it's time to send it. You know, we're all here for fun, but I think some of us are here for business. I mean, this was a fun idea to come out with the old triple sleds, but everybody here is like racers. So it's on, like, this is gonna be real. Like we're all trying. He's doing clutches. I've been lowering the sleds. Rich is going, I didn't do enough to my XCR, but it's gonna be good. You finished over there? Never. <laughs> For the sleds we're going to race today, I should also mention that none of them are prepared race sleds. In fact, they're barely prep sleds at all. Each of these machines are just good old runners, nothing special. And I know the speeds we're going to hit today are not going to be at their peak potential for any of them. For that, we'd have to install more than the 150 or so studs each machine is sporting now, plus spend way more time caring about gearing and clutching and carb tuning and suspensions and, well, just generally caring. These machines basically got a quick wipe down to clean the dust off and brought out to the ice. It will be a friendly competition for sure, but today is more about having some fun with the old iron and friends, both new and old. But I can see the social media comments right now in my head. They say that these sleds should have been faster, or we should have made the track longer, or that we should have spent more time preparing the sleds. All valid comments for sure, but sometimes you just have to play the cards you have. Okay guys, we are all here for fun today, but uh, I've seen it too often when a bunch of amateurs, which is really what we are, get together on an event like this where we're gonna have some high-speed snowmobiles, so I do wanna lay down a couple rules of the game. Obviously, when we're doing the uh, radar run and the drag racing, that track is one way only, so we're gonna go down that track at high speed. When you guys exit the end, you're gonna come back around on this far track over here in the deep snow, so that's gonna be your return. I only want sleds going down the track, not returning on the track. Um, another thing just to make a note of, uh, it's obviously super slick out there because we are right down to the ice all the way to the end. Um, I put a couple pylons down before the end of the ice. So at that point you can get off the throttle and start slowing down. Of course, you're gonna be on the ice at that point as well. And then transition to unplowed snow off the end of it. We're gonna do a couple of practice runs just so everybody get the lay of the land, but the transition from ice to natural snow of the lake, it's all plowed out. It's not very big, but it is gonna be a little bit of a rough patch. And if we're doing better than a C note, it could get interesting in a hurry. So just want everybody to be aware of that. So other than that, just stay safe and we're gonna have a good day. <laughs> After the reading of the riot act to shake the rust off ourselves and the sleds, we had a successful unlimited practice session. And when I say successful, I mean nobody crashed into each other. However, my hopes of a decent pull with the SCSI were dashed when I heard a slight bang going through the big end of the track. So not a good start with the Mach Z. I think I killed the plug already. But anyways, while I go back for a walk to rescue the Mach Z back there, I'm gonna tell you what we got going on. We got a track about 40 feet wide by about 1,320 feet long, way down there by a couple of pylons that you can't see. Once I get the Mach Z out of the way, we're gonna to start to race. Actually, he's already racing, but he's on a 200, so it's really not a race anyways. I had high hopes for the Mach Z too, and that happened. When you ride old stuff, be prepared. I thought it was a belt, I was wrong. Yay. Ah, oh, damn. Looking back, that could have been really bad. I said it back in the shop, I was more worried about the track staying together. <laughs> My crystal ball was right for a change. Anyways, I could have kicked Jake off the old SRX and run that, but I think I'll squeeze the trigger on the 650 even though there is no studs at all on that sled. 
well, other than the one riding it. Hundred and three mile an hour. Ninety four mile an hour. Ninety four mile an hour. Ninety two mile an hour. Right now though, it's all about going fast. Of the remaining sleds, it's no surprise the 650 was the slowest, but had excellent track speed as it swept the ice surface clean the entire length. The next sled was the SRX. It ran consistently in the low 90s, which was a little disappointing. I expected speeds closer to a C note. Maybe hour. this is one sled I'll have to spend a bit of time on to improve. Next is Don's 98 T-Cat. Pass after pass, the sled was at consistent 103 miles an hour while clawing, scratching, pawing, digging, and spinning the whole way down the ice surface. This sled was in desperate need of another 100 studs or so, maybe even chisels. Rich on the Polaris XCR rolled up like a boss on that sled and ripped the pass dominating at 107 miles an hour. I'm beginning to dislike this machine. However, that was a one and done speed. Every other pass that Rich made, he couldn't get the XCR to run above 102. Not sure where he found that extra five miles an hour for that one pass, but he did, and he took the win on the radar with it. For me, the big fail of the day is the Mach-Z. The track on that thing came apart at the big end when we were practicing, so I never even got a number out of it, but it looked pretty good on the speedometer when this blew out. Anyways, uh, at this point, we're gonna have lunch, and after lunch, we're gonna start drag race eliminations. Da -da -da. While those guys were racing, I was cooking too. Ooh, ha. Ha, yeah, yeah, it's nice and warm. There we go. Oh, there we go. Sausage and onion. This is gonna be great. Hey boys, to go along with the fish, I got packages of sausage and onion here for you too. Careful, they're a little warm. may have a little uh, tinge of two-stroke, but it'll be fine. Don't worry, just, just power through it. It'll be good. I'm gonna get some fish myself. So now that lunch is over and done with, it's time for drag race eliminations, but I'm gonna change things up a bit. For the radar run, the boys were actually starting on the beach before they even got to the ice, so they were able to get a run up before they hit the big end. This time for drag racing, we're gonna start from a standing start here at the beginning of the track, but I'm also gonna shorten the track up a little bit as well to basically level the playing field. This should be fun. With Rich taking the radar win, he'll match up after the TCAT and SRX battle. Now Don came to play, and the TCAT has got the SRX covered by around 20 or 30 horsepower, but I'm hoping for a close race with the plucky Yamaha. That hope didn't last long, as the TCAT powered out of the hole and said goodbye to that SRX as it was left napping on the starting line. The real race started when the TCAT and XCR pulled to the line. Now both were trending at basically the same pace for the radar run, and the shorter track and standing start should make for a close one. Both sleds left in a flurry of track spin with good reaction times from both Rich and Don. That crisp XCR though, it ran away with the win. So what an amazing day to have out on the ice. I mean, absolutely spectacular weather, spectacular sleds and spectacular friends. And I mean, I did have a little disappointment with the Moxie not being able to join the party for the drag racing, but still had an awesome time flagging that event. Now, the sun is just about to go down behind the horizon, yeah, but I think that leaves us just enough time for maybe one or two more laps of the drag strip or maybe that oval track. We'll have to see. Anyways, thanks for joining us this week on Snowmobiler Television. So back at the super secret white lake of flat frozen awesomeness, I was in the middle of one of my practice radar runs when I heard a little funny noise coming out of the SCSI here and that turned out to be the track coming apart. 
Now, by the position of the shrapnel that we picked up off the track, all of this happened at the quick end, which means if it really got any worse than it did, uh, that could have ended really badly for me. And when you think about it, if the track comes out of the back of your snowmobile, it takes your brakes with it. And given the speeds we were going on the track and the low snow and icy conditions we were on, I'm pretty sure if this track did exit out the back of the SCSI, it would have rode me right to the point of the wreck. Now, if you remember, I was kind of concerned about the condition of the track even before we brought this thing to the ice. I probably should have known better, but it's what I had. Now, speaking of what I had, you'll notice I have another track underneath the SCSI here. Back when I bought this sled, it came with another basket case backup sled. And wouldn't you know it? <laughs> there was a track in the pile of parts. Now this track isn't much better than the one that came apart, but I really didn't feel like spending six or $700 on a new one, which would have been like half of what I paid for the whole sled. Instead, this old ratty used one is not just good, but good enough. Now, as you can see, I've already started the process of changing the track here on the SCSI, which isn't really too bad on the CK3 chassis, despite having to take the whole chain case out to do the job. At this point, I've got to get the chain case cover back on and oil in there, the rear suspension back in, tighten up the track, and basically, that should only take a minute or two here in TV land. Um, looks like we're gonna need a montage. Replacing a track is one of the bigger jobs on the sled. It's not real complicated, but there's a lot of things that have to come apart and go back together again to make it happen. The trickiest bit is usually the chain case. With all its moving parts, there are shims and washers and gears that all have to go back in correctly to work, especially on setups with these old mechanical reversers. Just remember, it's only nuts and bolts. So the next part of this job is to get the rear suspension back in the sled over there. But like any time when you have your rear suspension out, it's the perfect opportunity to have a really good look at everything. Now before this goes back in, I'm gonna show you a couple of details you need to be looking for, plus a problem that I found on this thing. The number one thing to look for is these pivot shafts. They can seize up inside the different suspension arms. And when they do that, instead of rotating the way they should, it starts turning the bolts holding them to the suspension rails. This can loosen the bolts off, backing them right out, or make the threads act like a saw and they start cutting through the aluminum rail itself. If you can't get the Zerk fittings to take grease, it's a good indicator that the shaft is seized or getting close to it. Next, check for any bad bogey bearings, thin spots in the slides, and for any other broken or missing parts. So with the suspension on the bench with this inspection, I actually found something that I missed when it was in the SCSI. The shaft that goes across the bottom between the suspension rails that basically holds the front shock in place, the bolt was loose. And what it was doing was traveling up and down inside the aluminum and it actually chewed out a pretty big oblong hole there. Now to fix this properly, it should be welded and re-drilled. I don't have time for all that. So I made a little steel plate to catch the aluminum extrusion, put a new bolt in it, and I'm gonna send it. I have to get the suspension back in the sled and with the help of another montage, this should go quickly. Ten mil, ten, oh. ten mil's missing again. Now getting the suspension back in, inside the track is a little tricky because there's so many knobs and other stuff to get hung up on. Backing the rear axle off to make the suspension as short as possible helps. Now once inside, a little muscle or a tug with a ratchet strap can help pull things into position to bolt up the suspension arms. So with the sled pretty much back together, it's not quite ready to go to the lake just yet. And you see, here's where hindsight comes into play. Rich on that exquisite XCR ran 107 miles an hour down the ice. And honestly, even with that new track, I don't think the SCSI has it in it. So since we've been to the ice, I've gone to the interwebs and let my fingers do some shopping and well, had some more parts delivered to the shop that are going to um, optimize it a bit more. All right, so let's go through the list of goodies that I've got for the SCSI. First, woody studs, because one thing all of those sleds suffered from out on the ice was grip. So we're gonna put another 96 studs in this on top of the 96 studs that are in there for 192 or so, because there's a bunch of broken ones, but that is really gonna do wonders to get this thing down the ice. Now, for what's in this box, 
knife. Here we've got packing materials. I got some bearings in case I needed them for the drive shaft, but I didn't. I've got some spindle bushings, but I'm not gonna put those in there just yet. Um, what I do have though is spark plugs. Lots of spark plugs, because that thing was eating them like candy. Uh, let's see, I've also got uh, a primary clutch kit, which I'm gonna install some of. I got a secondary clutch kit because the buttons on that one are toast. And in case we needed it, I picked up a fuel filter. But the secret sauce to this whole thing is, ta-da, V-Force reeds. These things are gonna pump so much more air into that thing and it's gonna propel that Mach Z down the ice at better than 107 miles an hour. It better, anyways, it better. So to begin my optimization of the SCSI, I'm gonna start with studs. Now, if there was an Achilles heel with all those other machines on the ice that day, it was their lack of grip on that really hard lake ice. And installing studs is definitely gonna add mile an hour to the Mach Z because it's gonna be able to get going that much faster. Now, when it comes to installing studs, there's really no simple, easy way or trick to get around it. You just have to do it. I'm adding 96 woody studs to the outside of the track. Now, there's already 96 old studs on the inside, or at least there was at one time because there's about 10 or so broken off. Now, adding these additional studs should develop a bit more grip on the ice with two more lines of studs going down. Every other old triple sled we ran had huge issues with traction the whole way down the run, so the only way to improve traction on the ice is with more studs. So there's no shortcut or trick to this job, although 96 studs on the outside of the track does go pretty easy. However, it's still a drill, assemble, tighten, repeat type of process. For me though, I like to drill and assemble first, then get in the groove of tightening up all the studs in one go. But there's no wrong way to do this job and you can do it any way you like. Now I may have mentioned that there's no trick to doing this job, but I lied to you, there actually is one. And it's this tool right here that holds an Allen key that holds the head of the stud in place when you're tightening them up. This is an absolute finger saver to do this job. I highly recommend it. When it comes to traction, there's no substitute for studs. Not only is acceleration and top speeds improved, but so is braking. Now, when it comes to snowmobile performance, all that power can go to waste if you can't get it to the ice. But even if your riding style isn't all about performance, studs can still improve safety and stability when you encounter an unexpected icy patch. With 96 new Woody studs installed on the track, I'm gonna turn my attention to the clutches, which I've already got here on the bench. Now, before the last radar run, I did take them apart, clean them up, and scuffed up the sheaves, that type of thing. But when I was in there, I did notice a number of things that were starting to get worn out. So, with the time off, I was able to order some new parts, and we're gonna install those right away. Snowmobile clutches are a bit of a mystery to a lot of riders and for good reason. There is a lot going on in here and each clutch needs to be working together for performance. That said, they do wear out over time and if you want to do any performance tuning at all, you will be fighting against a worn out system if it's not right. For the few short runs I got out of the sled before the track failure, I found the max RPMs were all over the place, a pretty good indicator that there is a problem. Clutch servicing usually takes some specialty tools to get it done, so this job might be beyond most amateur mechanics. But if you want to invest in a few tools, I'm going to mention YouTube again as a great resource where you can follow a clutch service tutorial from the beginning to end for just about every type of system out there. For the SCSI, all the bits in here are stock, but the ramp shoes on the secondary and the bushings on the primary are completely shot. So if I have any hope for these clutches to shift out to a big speed number, I've got to do this job. 
Now I ran through this work pretty quickly, but like a lot of jobs so far on the SCSI, they can all be done by just about anybody reasonably competent turning wrenches and maybe with just a few specialty tools. So if you think you're up to stuff like this, I suggest going for it. After all, it's just nuts and bolts. Just remember to take your time, take pictures if you need to, and keep your parts in order as best you can. And at the end of the day, all the work we're doing to the SCSI is just nuts and bolts. With the clutches done, the next job on the SCSI is the installation of the new reeds. Now, I'm putting a lot of faith in these things because it's the reeds that's gonna push me past the 107 mile an hour mark set by that all stock XCR. Never installed these things before, so I'm looking forward to this job. The reeds are a direct replacement for the stock ones, but flow much more air because of the double tiered design and lightweight carbon fiber pedals. With an engine essentially being an air pump, the more efficient it is at moving air means it can make more power. Now we'll see on the ice, but I'm hoping these are a big part of the recipe to speed. I just wish I had a number on the ice last time as a baseline to go from for speed, because with all these new parts going on the SCSI, if it at least doesn't run numbers similar to Rich's XCR and Don's TCAT, it must have been a real turd before. With the new reeds, the rebuilt clutches, all those woody studs installed on that ratty old track, all put together on this Crap Can Mach Z, you can definitely say we're smearing a whole bunch of lipstick on this pig. But before we go to the lake, there's one more job I gotta do. Go fast stickers. These things, it's an easy two mile an hour extra on the top end. That XCR is going down. So the moment of truth is finally here. Last time on the ice, we had the whole gang of triples out. This time, it's just the SCSI with one goal in mind. This has got to run faster than 107 miles an hour. We got about 45 minutes before that sun goes down. So we're gonna film each and every pass that the SCSI makes. But honestly, I'm not sure if this thing is gonna hold together mechanically. And hopefully by the time the sun does go down, this thing has finally beaten that XCR. Honestly though, <laughs> I have no idea what's going to happen next. which I think it did back at the shop, so. Like you just popped it now? I think it was, when it got here, they were dead. I was hoping it would come back alive, but it didn't.
one on one again. Well, it's back to the drawing board, as they say. 101 miles an hour out of the scuzz here isn't too bad, but it sure isn't 107 miles an hour, which was my goal. You know, thinking about it, maybe I should put a new drive belt on it or new piston rings or, you know, maybe change the track because that used one I put on is already shedding studs out of it. But you know what? Working on the scuzz here has been an absolute blast and brought back a lot of good memories. So I think I'll probably bring it back to the shop, throw more parts at it, and try again for that elusive 107 mile an hour number. Why? Just because. You know, the more I think about it, and that one pass Rich made at 107 miles an hour, well, he only did that once, and I never saw the gun. Now, I'm not calling him out on it, but it does kind of sound like something that came out of the south end of a northbound facing bull. That's fine though, it's okay, I'm fine with it. I was given the number of 107 miles an hour to beat, and that's the number I'm trying to beat with the scuzz. This means I still have to find five miles an hour out of this old chassis to beat my 107 mile an hour target. With this being our last show of the season, this is also my last chance to do it on camera, so I've gathered up some more parts to hopefully push this old blister past the goal. There we go. So here's my new list, not to be confused with the old list. The new list starts with a new to me track and the reason we're changing the track on this thing is because the last new to me track that we installed on the SCSI, well, it started shedding studs almost immediately on the ice so I want to change that out before it fires one through a heat exchanger and ends our day. We're also going to install 96 new woody studs in it too just for enough traction to get down the ice. After that, we're gonna clean the carbs because right now the SCSI is not happy. It's running really bad, but part of that problem is not only the carbs, I also think it's the old fuel in this thing because I haven't even put gas in this thing yet. I'm still rocking the fuel that I got when I bought the sled. And keep in mind, this thing hasn't run for three years, so it's gonna get a carb clean and fresh gas, and because nothing is too good for the SCSI, we're gonna throw on a new drive belt too. After that, we're gonna change the brake fluid because after a pass or two down the ice, that old brake fluid gets so hot and starts to boil and your brakes fade away to nothing. Don't really need brakes for a radar run, but it is a little spooky going that fast knowing you have no brakes at all. So we're gonna change the brake fluid. After that, we're gonna lift the suspension back up because since we've been to the ice, there's been a lot of top water come in and it's got a significant hump in the middle at probably the 80, 85 mile an hour mark. So I want enough suspension on the SCSI to be able to deal with that little heave that's in there. Last is down here, new piston rings because the compression on the SCSI is uh, not good. The only problem with these new piston rings is I don't have them in my possession in the shop yet. So I'm really hoping the courier shows up before we got to go to the ice. So that is a lot of wrenching to get done by the end of the week when we're scheduled to be back on the ice. And if we don't get back to the ice, we're gonna lose the shop. Actually, no, we're not really gonna lose the shop, but I am on deadline to get the show done, so I don't really have a whole lot of time to waste unless I have a good reason to waste time. And here's my reason. On social media, a lot of you were asking for the sound of these old triples running. So before we get to wrenching, we're gonna play some sound clips of these old sleds just ripping it down the ice. This will be like bacon for your ears. Okay, on the drop. Sorry, I got carried away with all those sled sounds with a V8 here in the shop. Anyways, coming up after the break, we start wrenching on the SCSI.
With the big day coming, the first job we're going to do on the SCSI is replace the track, which is one of the most involved jobs you can do on a snowmobile, but it's just labor intensive. It's really not that bad. You will need a key tool though, and that's an impact wrench to break the bolts loose, holding the rear suspension in place. After that, you can use some luxury items like maybe a snowmobile lift will make the job go easier. And if you can arrange it, try to do the work in a heated shop because this job is going to take a couple of hours and you don't want to do that in the cold. Step one usually begins by removing the rear suspension, but if your track is garbage like this one, you can skip ahead to the track removal part right away. There is something just satisfying about cutting your track off. Now doing this actually helps get it out of the way for when you're dealing with the drive axle a little later on in about step, I don't know, 47 or so. Now obviously don't cut your track off if you plan on reusing this thing, but really, if I have to tell you this, then maybe you're better off taking this job to a professional. Back to step number one, which is the removal of the rear suspension. This is where the impact really helps out to remove the four bolts holding the arms in place. Trying to do this with just a ratchet never really works out. You need the speed and hammer action to break both sides loose on the pivot shafts. At this point, without the track in the way, everything comes out easy. If the track is still in there, you'll have to shorten up the rear axle as much as you can and then fight with everything a bit to get the suspension out. It actually tells you that in the snowmobile repair manual, you will have to fight with this job. Well, actually it doesn't really say that, but you're going to have to fight with this job. Next, start digging in the engine bay by removing everything in the way of getting the side cover off the chain case. This normally involves removing the exhaust, which is something I'm getting really good at on the old SCUS here. With the muffler out, I'm going to undo the chain case cover and just let whatever oil's in there go everywhere because there's no drain in this case. If yours does have a drain though, do that before the cover comes off. It's way less messy. I've also got to get the mechanical reverser out of the way. Now there's lots of gears and springs and shafts and spacers in here, so be sure to make note of how that stuff came out for when it has to go back in. Now the brake caliper has to be unbolted as well because the whole chain case on this chassis has to come out, which actually isn't too hard to do. And with everything undone, it'll all come out in one piece. The next step is to remove the secondary to get access to the drive shaft bearing on this side. Now there's usually a speedometer housing to deal with here and a little drive pin on the inside that gets lost super easy, so keep that in mind. With the track previously removed, you can now get under there and pull out the drive axle. Again, this usually involves a little fight if the track is still wrapped around it, and it's especially fun dealing with a studded track too. So at this point, we're about halfway through this project, but before we get to reassembly, I want to tell you about the new-to-me track that I've got. I picked this bad boy up used from JT Power Sports, and I think it came off an Articat at one point, but it doesn't really matter because it's still a 121-inch track with a 252 pitch. Now the pitch refers to the distance between the lugs, but also the drives, which is exactly the same for the SCSI, so this thing's going to go on there just fine. It's also got a really short lug on it, which is good for speed, but it's also going to work with those studs I'm going to recover out of that other track. Removing old studs out of an old track is not a fun job and I wouldn't recommend it. However, if you're trying to recover studs that are in good shape out of a track that's say gotten ripped or torn on something, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. What I would do is make sure the nylon locking ring inside your nylock nut is in good shape. Otherwise, just throw a new nut on it when you go to reassemble them. For this old track, I'm planning on reusing as many of the same holes as possible, but there's two pull throughs on this track that I'm not going to reinstall studs in. If you feel the need, you can drill another hole next to the pull through as long as the track isn't torn to reinstall a replacement stud in that bar. Personally though, I wouldn't be drilling a new hole too close to a stud that's been pulled through a track. Instead, I would just live with a hole in my pattern. And speaking of patterns, whoever installed the studs on this track didn't have one. Now they were trying for a 48 stud pattern, which is two studs every other bar. And for the most part, it worked out except for, well, here and here. Not really a problem unless your OCD is getting to you, but there is a two part solution to make sure your pattern works out. And the first part of that solution is getting yourself a studding template like this one from Woody's. These patterns are available for all track lengths and pitches and will lay out multiple different stud patterns depending on how many studs you want to install and what kind of traction you're looking for. The next part of the solution is marking your track out before you drill it. That way, if for some reason the pattern doesn't work out, you can simply remark it. Whoever laid out the studs in this one started drilling right away and ultimately had to live with the result. 
With all the studs taken out of this old cat track, I'm going to lay out a new pattern that works with as many of the old holes as possible, but that means I can't use a Woody's template. Now I'm still going to install two studs per bar all up the middle for a total of 96, which I'm hoping will be a good balance between grip and speed. With the last track on the SCSI, I had about 180 some odd studs in this thing, which was a lot of grip, but it was also a lot of weight. Now, the weight definitely killed my top end, so I'm hoping this time with only 96 studs in this track, there'll be enough grip to keep that monster hooked up at the big end. If this was a drag race situation over a short distance, more studs would definitely be better, like a 192 pattern, which is four studs per bar, helping it hook up for ultimate grip. On the other end of the scale is just enough studs to keep the sled under control on icy trail conditions. And depending on the pitch of the track, this usually works out to around 50 or so. To show the difference between a machine with studs and without, we took a pair of snowmobiles out to the ice to really demonstrate how a studded snowmobile is much more controllable. Showing the benefits of studding for performance gains is pretty simple, but adding studs to the track of your machine really does add predictability to your snowmobiling experience. Let's face it, going down the trail, you can't always spot that icy patch that's coming up in front of you. And if the rear of your sled suddenly wants to swap ends with the front, well, that can end pretty badly. All right, so the rear suspension and the tracks are installed on this thing. Probably the two jobs I hate doing most on a snowmobile, but they're done. Right now though, for a break, I'm gonna work on the front suspension and then I'm gonna go to the carbs before I stud the track. And it's all gonna get done today. With the suspension back up in the air, I'll feel much better heading down the ice with the big heave in the middle of the track. I don't mind going on a sketchy ride, but I do know my limit. Up next is the carburetors. Carb problems can be a major issue for old sleds, especially with today's fuel that seems to go bad right before your eyes, gumming up and plugging the small passages inside the carbs. These are what's called rack style carbs, meaning they're all mounted together on a rack so the whole thing gets removed in one big assembly. Now I've taken the throttle cable off but left the enrichment cable on because it just seemed easier this way. Now looking inside these things, they're pretty clean, so I'm not taking them all the way apart, but I did find a couple of problems with the pilot jets. Two of them were plugged up solid, even though these carbs were clean when I opened them up. Now for the rest of it, I'm just using some carb cleaner to clean out the different orifices and then a little bit of compressed air to make sure they're blown out. One thing to be careful of though, whenever you go into carburetors, double check your main jet because these things can be different from one cylinder to another. And if you screw them up going back in, you could end up burning your engine down. With the carbs assembled and reinstalled in the chassis, I'm gonna move on to the brakes. Brake fluid has a tendency to pull in water from the atmosphere. That's why they're sealed up the way they are. Any water in the system lowers the boiling point of the fluid and causes brake fade. Then over time, the fluid just gets old and contaminated anyways. I'm assuming the stuff in the SCSI is original and replacing it with new good stuff should keep the brakes from fading away out on the track. And I know what you're gonna say, what do you need brakes for anyways? They just slow you down. Basically what I'm trying to do here is put new fluid up in the reservoir and pump that new stuff through the whole system into the caliper. And basically it just changes the fluid out. You can tell the old stuff is kind of nasty and rusty and all milky in there, but it's starting to get clear in the tube. When it comes out nice and clear, you know you're good. One thing to be careful of though is don't ever run the reservoir out of fluid. With that job done, I'm going to move on to finishing up the installation of the studs in the track. 98 shouldn't take long, especially with half the holes already drilled. Now it's too late to change my mind, but installing these newer studs on an old track, and by the way, did I mention it was off a 98 Articat ZL500? That makes this track 23 years old? Anyways, I wouldn't recommend doing this. I'm surprised at how loose these old holes are, and if there was any big miles ahead for this track, I don't think the studs would last long before they would start coming out. Good thing I'm only planning on doing top speed runs, otherwise, what could possibly go wrong? What this means is, I'm probably in for at least one more remove and reinstall of a track on the SCSI. Yeah, I'm definitely not looking forward to that. Well, we only got a couple of things to wrap up on the SCSI here before we head to the ice, and my next job is gonna be installing pipes. But 
you might be wondering, why am I installing pipes now? What about the piston rings? Well, we've had a fail there. They never showed up to the shop and got a call and said that the parts are on back order. Go figure. Parts for an old sled are hard to come by this year. Strange. After the pipes are installed back in the chassis, I'll have one more quick look at those carbide runners. They may have to be good enough for one more day at the track, because I'm getting antsy to squeeze the trigger on this sled. Still not sure though if it has 107 miles an hour in it, but I'm definitely curious to know what it'll run. Well, we finally made it back here to the ice for the last segment of the last show of the 2020-2021 season of Snowmobiler Television. And this is also my last shot at Radar Run Glory when the Mach Z that I've nicknamed the SCSI goes down that track at 107, actually 108 miles an hour, it would be even better. But I'm not sure if this pile is gonna do it. And if it doesn't, I'm totally blaming those piston rings that never showed up. I've already spent some time prepping the track with a tractor and blower, but it's not quite as nice as it was earlier this season. Keeping ahead of the snow and drifting is a bit of challenge and the track has gotten a little smaller, but I've kept the length though, cause I'm certain the old SCSI is gonna need every inch to beat that XCR of riches. I've got a little bit of time here before the sun sets, so I'm gonna do a couple of passes just to make sure everything's okay with the sled and that the suspension's working over the rough section and that my brakes stay alive. Now, the last time I was on the ice here, this thing did 102 miles an hour, but that was with the heavy track and all those studs. This new track with the fewer amount of studs, I just don't know if there's gonna be another five or six miles an hour in this thing. I'm really curious to find out. I just hope this thing is gonna to stay together long enough to make a fast pass. At this point here on the ice, about the only thing I can adjust is the TRA clutch. Other than that, this is basically a run what you brung type of scenario. So far on my warm up passes, things are looking good. Nothing's leaking more than usual under the hood and the sparkulators seem to be making lightning. So I think it's time to make a real pass. That, man, that felt fast. 103 mile an hour. 103? 103. It's not bad. That's one extra mile an hour from where it was before. You know, you know there's, there's one other thing I can do. I got one other trick up my sleeve. You guys, stay here. I'll be right back. What other thing can he possibly have up his sleeve? I don't know. He always has something up his sleeve. mile an hour. That felt faster. 108 mile an hour. 108 mile an hour, yeah! If you can't beat them, join them! <laughs> 108! Although I had to do it on an XCR. Oh well. <laughs> Man, what a great season with the old SCSI. Now, looking back, we probably did a little bit too much with the old sled, but it did allow us to produce a complete season for STV and have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> Those old greasy triples, they're a blast. Now, you may have noticed that the old SCSI let me down pretty hard on the lake and never ran a number even close to Rich on that XCR of his. And for me to even get close to Rich's XCR, I had to borrow another XCR to do it. But I should let you in on a secret, one that Rich doesn't even know yet. And the secret is that that XCR that I borrowed, well, it didn't run faster than Rich's XCR. Not even close, actually. But you see, through treachery and the magic of television editing, I was able to cheat the number. I simply told Al that whatever number appeared on the radar gun, just call out 108. <laughs> well, I know that was cheating, and 
I also know that Rich probably won't be happy when he learns of this because when he first saw it on STV, he called me and couldn't believe that my XCR outran his XCR by one mile an hour. But really, I mean, can you blame me? If, if you were in my shoes, wouldn't you do the same? All this proves is that the old SCSI never fails to fail, but it also means I get another season ahead of me to try to get the SCSI to go faster than 107 miles an hour. And this time, I promise I won't cheat. Looking ahead for the SCSI, I've got new pistons and rings for it already. I've got some clutch work scheduled, a new track to install, and a bunch of other fun stuff to hopefully find some more speed out of the old girl. One thing's for certain though, I know I've got another season of greasy old triple fun ahead of me with a SCSI. STV is brought to you by CKX, wear your passion. Schaefer's, specialized lubricants since 1839. Best Western Hotels and Resorts, ready to get away? One epic adventure we're calling the Scuzzy Skaga. The Scuzzy Skaga. What the? <laughs> I'm keeping that. <laughs> the Scuzzy Skaga. Hold on, hold on. Okay, go for Scuzzy Skaga. What the hell is a Skaga? Skaga? Saga. No, should we? Uh, we'll go with Skaga. That's good enough. <laughs> Roll it. <laughs>